We feel very honoured to be kicking off today's event, um, but also we think very modestly, of course, that it's very appropriate that we should be beginning today because this is where it all began. The two grassroots actions acting together, the Bradley Sisters, development of bush regeneration and the grassroots lobbying to save public land, particularly bushland. So I'm Kate Eccles, as Andrew said, I'm the president of Mossman Parks and Bushland. And in a moment, I'll introduce you to Anne Cook, our in-house historian. But to start with, I think we should acknowledge that this land we are on is Borragagi and Camaragal land. As current carers for Guragal, child ahead, we acknowledge their past care for this land and we commit ourselves with respect to carrying on that love of country. Mossman Parks and Bushland began life back in 1964 when a bulldozer was observed ripping into bushland on Bradley's head to make a road and a car park for the zoo. The Sydney Harbour National Park wasn't, wasn't gazetted until 1975 and in 1964, the area was called Ashton Park. We'll get various viewing points for that as we go. The Ashton Park Association was formed to protest against the road and among the founding members were Eileen and Joan Bradley. And at one of the very first meetings, Joan brought up the weed problem and showed photographic evidence. So over the years, the Ashton Park Association morphed into Mossman Parks and Bushland and advocacy for the environment and public land on the one hand and bush regeneration on the other have continued to be the association's two pillars. You could perhaps say that they're two aspects of the same thing and that's what's going to be shown repeatedly during our tour today. Public land is always wanted for something. Uncared for public land is at double risk. So as we work th walk through Chowd Ahead, I'll be telling you about how Mossman Parks and Bushlands and my connection with this piece of land came about and how the Bradley's principles are being applied. You'll also hear a piece of excellent news about a grant from the Mossman Environmental Foundation that will give us some much needed help. And now I'll ask Anne Cook to tell you about these two fascinating women, the Bradley sisters, and how their observations led to the development of bush regeneration. Anne was awarded a high distinction for a 70,000 word original research paper on the origins of bush regeneration and received a graduate diploma in public history. Her professor was Bob Rees of Murdoch University, Western Australia. So, over to you, Anne. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll get straight into it. Um, the Bradley sisters lived around the corner there in Iluka Road in a very modest little cottage um, <clears throat> from 1949. They, um, they, su they supported it. Uh, Joan, was a, um, Joan was an industrial chemist pre-war. She had a Bachelor of Science from Sydney University. Um, but by the time they moved here in 1949, they were working f um, in a, they, they had a small um, soft furnishings business. And Joan also uh, advertised her services as a photographer. So they had, um, they also live with their very elderly mother and, and um, as soon as they were able to sort of um, uh, live without uh, that income, they devoted themselves to, uh, to their local area, their niche. Um, they, they did, uh, as we know, they did walks through um, the bushland here and through Ashton Park, walking their dog, but also doing bird surveys 
they their local uh, their daily walks through the neighbouring bushland and council-owned uh, foreshore reserve at different times and under varying conditions had deepened their relationship with their corner of the earth to a point which had probably not been approached by anyone else since the Borogogi people had left the area in the early 19th century. They, um, they were great gardeners, that was a family legacy. They belonged to the Iris Society. Um, they composted uh, according to the principles developed by Sir Albert Howard in, um, in India in the 19th century. They named their compost heap Sir Albert. <laughs> so people were often baffled to hear someone call out, I've put Winston Churchill on Sir Albert, sorry, vice versa, I've put Sir Albert on Winston, Winston Churchill being the name of an iris species. Um, they uh, also at this, from while they were living here, they helped to establish with Barbara Cooper of West Pennant Hills, the Kelpie Council of New South Wales, which is still cons is an important resource for both the pastoral industry and a service to the breed of Kelpies themselves. They were totally systematic about everything they did. Um, and then they did, as time passed, they did their uh, bird surveys and, and then they narrowed it down to blue wrens because they were easier to observe because they were ground drilling and they wrote a very authoritative um, article for the EMU which was the Journal of the Royal Ornithological Society as it was called then, now Birds Australia and it's still considered authoritative. They helped to solve the mystery of helpers at the nest which had baffled birders uh, up until that point. So I've got a copy of that in here and I'll pass that around later. In 1964, it became very clear to the Bradleys and others that the biggest uh, threat to the well-being of their patch would come from the gentlemen board members of the Ashton Park Trust. The Ashton Park Trust, it was referred to as the Siamese Trust, and Ashton Park Trust and Taronga Zoological Park Trust, the boards were identical with Sir Edward Hallstrom. Uh, the chairman of both boards and then his son. So it was clear that Ashton Park was regarded as a resource for the zoo, as a dumping ground, as a quarry, as plant material for the animals and um, ultimately of course as available space for car parking and whatever. So in 1964, a pivotal year, the, with no notice to council and the residents, the Ashton Park Trust authorised the destruction of the bush and the construction of a road through the park over there on that headland to the water's edge, a road from nowhere to nowhere, some people said. Locals were outraged and a public meeting was called. A local alderman told the trust that the, the, told the meeting that the trust had a schizophrenic personality with conflict of interest resolved in favour of hot hippopotamy. <laughs> It was decided to form the Ashton Park Trust, the objectives of which, of which were threefold, to prevent further encroachment on the park, to restore as much as possible of the originally dedicated area, and to preserve the park for public recreation and enjoyment with as much bushland as possible. In this way was formed one of the first resident action groups in Sydney, now called the Mossman Parks and Bushland Association. It was in, 19, in Milo Dumphy's view, expressed in 1988, a redoubtable group of conservationists. They would hardly have been have recognised themselves as such according to uh, Western Australian iron ore magnate Lan Hancock's definition of conservationist as the number one enemy of civilization and hence Australia, whose numbers are swelled by a great mass of unwashed, unspanked, dull bludging droppers. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Despite the intense lobbying uh, undertaken, uh, the construction of the road went ahead. Another challenge to the bushland came in the winter of 1965, uh, a drought year in New South Wales. On the 8th of July, Michael Kartsoff of the New South Wales Forestry Commission carried out a burn which he had advised the Ashton Park Trust would be necessary in order to promote new growth and to reduce the fire hazard, two objectives on the face of it not easily reconcilable with each other. Because of this fiasco, of the of the roadway, the council Mossman Council decided that it needed representation on the Ashton Park Trust, and in 1965 two aldermen were appointed to the trust. 
1966, the Trust introduced a master plan for the development of Ashton Park, which would have greatly benefited the zoo, converting 10 and a half acres of bushland into a parking area. It was also proposed that a visitor's centre, superintendent's residence and a large terrace seating area be developed all out of Ashton Park. At the new Resident Action Group's AGM in July, the members were warned Taronga could swallow Ashton at a gulp. And they made all these flyers that went around. It was, they um, responded, the association responded with a critique of this master plan co-authored by Joan Bradley and June Graham, another um, absolutely stalwart conservationist in this area. They felt that the development proposal violated three important principles of land use, the social, the aesthetic and the physical, and that the gross interference with the natural environment would have destroyed its future as an example of the original environment of Port Jackson. Um, responding to the master plan, the association wanted to take a positive line where possible and did note that on the plus side, the trust had for the first time made its plans public and that it had attempted to address issues of weed infestation and soil erosion. The committee also offered an alternative plan which they, in which they proposed that three questions should be asked of any proposal for development in Ashton Park. Will it fit into the pattern of public use? Will it look well or be well concealed? Will it benefit the bush or at worst cause no harm? The association members knew that parks and reserves the world over have one important feature in common, they are always being reduced in area. The activities of conservationists here and in uh, the broader Sydney Basin fed into this um, debate. Uh, Alan Strong, I think 1968, um, of the Wildlife Preservation Society gave a talk to the association, yeah, winter of 1968, which made a big impression and which the association pub subsequently published. It was called the Small Natural Reserve. In terms of small natural reserves, such as these in Mossman, Strom pointed out that their size may be such as to make their demise only a matter of time, especially if they exist, as did most or all in Mossman, in isolation and even more so these days as the impacts of climate change are hitting us globally as well as locally. In 1967, aged 51, her credibility thoroughly well established because of the critical evaluation and her BSc and perhaps despite her gender, Joan Bradley was appointed to the Ashton Park Trust, the only woman in a photo of all the other, all the blokes in suits and Joan in a lovely bright, dress shining out. <laughs> By the time the association was formed in 1964, the Bradley sisters had been observing for years the encroachment of weeds in their bushland. And at one of the first meetings of the association, Joan had shown photographic evidence of the extent of the problem. It was suggested that voluntary labour be recruited to get in and start hacking away, but a dissenting voice, no doubt one of the sisters, suggested the job was too big for such an approach and that areas of healthy bush might be damaged in the process. Instead, it was decided to inform the trust of the extent of the problem and urged that a program of progressive eradication be initiated, followed by replanting. Um, of course, this all took a bit of time um, in uh, September 64, at the beginning of the summer growing season, Joan gave the Trust a list of plants suitable for replanting, but by May 1965, the matter of replanting was still under consideration while the clearing of weeds by Maddock, Ho and Brushhook proceeded. The weeds, of course, not having to consult or seek advice, finding the disturbed soil to be ideal for their needs, were growing back stronger than ever all through the good summer growing conditions, especially the annuals. Joan approached the Wildlife Preservation Society and asked them to make a general census of plants in Ashton Park. They formed relationships with Thistle Harris, the Parks and Wildlife, the, sorry, the Parks and Playground Movement of New South Wales and the Society for Growing Australian Plants, all in an attempt to work out how to replant the cleared areas. They began collecting specimens and propagating seed as well. It seemed obvious that clearing followed by replanting of the cleared earth must be the answer, so that the problem of weed invasion was twofold. Council engineers and labourers, men and their big machines, knew how to tackle the first stage, but clearly replanting was a different sort of operation altogether, and no one really knew how to go about it, what sort of stock to plant, how to source it, and how to maintain it. The, the Bradleys had, of course, been looking at the um, 
weeds for, uh, at the weed encroachment for a long time and so other members of the association seem to get a bit irritated by their being fixated about the weeds. Um, but they needed to show, the association needed to show support for the goals of the operation in order to retain the cooperation of the trust, the Ashton Park Trust and the council. They watched from the sidelines as the labourers belted, uprooted and burned the weeds and helped by going in afterwards and raking up the deep debris. Revisiting the sites, they saw that the weeds were growing back in profusion. While on the ground waiting for the slashing and burning operations to finish so they could go in and clear up, they began to pull up stray weeds at the edge of the worst infestations in relatively good bush. When they returned to these sites later, they realised that in these relatively good areas along the margins of the cleared areas, the bush was growing back by itself. And this is how Joan later explained. We always pulled up weeds in passing. We started by just drifting into it. In 1964, the council hacked away at Ashton Park and of course it grew back into Lantana practically overnight. We didn't dream of following it up. But as we began to pull stray weeds in good bush, we could see that the bush began to help itself. They realised that once freed from competition, the native plants formed a stronger front and so were able to recolonise the smaller stray patches of cleared earth adjacent. In other words, weed, weed eradication was most effective if one began not where the weeds were worst, which was the sort of obvious approach, but where the natives were strongest. This was a radical idea, the very opposite of conventional practice of the time. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that other people um, this is just anecdotal, but other people um, in, in their own uh, private land holdings or areas of responsibility were moving towards the same thing and probably were practicing the same thing. But it's the case that the Bradley sisters and the association systematized this method. Um, it's also worth pointing out, I think, that uh, Joan read um, Yeoman's Water for Every Farm, and they were also familiar with Albert Morris in Broken Hill, who realised that the terrible dust storms they experienced out there were the result of devegetation around the town. So he um, he began to uh, the the people there began to fence off bushland so that it could be um, uh, so that it would regenerate by itself. So it was fenced off from animals and so on. So, so the, the ideas were around. Um, in uh, 1967, they published, the association published a paper written by Joan and Eileen, and I'll, I'll show you this, it's, I can pass that around later. Weeds and their control was an attempt to come to grips with the weed problems in Ashton Park. Um, in the 19... 70 report of the Ashton Park Association, it was noted that Mrs. E. and J. Bradley have perfected a method of selective, hand, uh, selective weed removal, and this has been successfully used for regenerating bushland in the park and on Charter Head. In 1971, the association published Joan Bradley's Bush Regeneration, seminal work. It represents a development of the ideas first put forward in weeds and their control, but was designed to be used in a wider context. Uh, between the weeds and their control in 67 and bush regeneration in 71, the encouragement of natives, not the eradication of weeds, had become the primary goal. It was subtle but a very significant sh shift in emphasis which enabled the Bradleys to better come to grips with the issue of timing and direction. If weed removal is the primary goal, you go as far as fast as you can, slash and burning. If, if, um, if thinking of the regenerating natives, you only go as far and as fast as the bush can follow, or as fast as there is time for resources for follow-up. Uh, although fairly easily grasped in principle, in practice it was more complex, of course, determining out in the field in a specific site just how regrowth can occur. The three principles of bush regeneration were expressed in this 1971 volume for the first time as work from good areas to bad, keep the soil deeply mulched, later expressed as disturb the soil as little as possible, and allow regeneration to dictate the rate of clearing. The word was out because a lot of, um, they lobbied and they, they spread, they published, and it was, I think the print, first print run sold out in about, I think it was 500 copies sold out in a few months. From, from Mossman it went to um, Lane Cove uh, Conservation 
Bushland Conservation Society, which we're going to, which we're going to and it went to the, the battlers at, at Kelly's Bush. And the Ludovic. And Blackwood. the Ludovic. Well, that was when Joan was employed, employed by, by the, the trust. trust. Yeah, it was a bit later. So yeah, out it went. Thank you. Fantastic. And here we are. And here we are. <laughs> Eileen used to work on this headland and that's what and she it was apparently left when she died she was credited with having left it in a virtually pristine condition so and she developed her own certain methods here too but over the years this it, it was managed when she was working by Mossman Council but then it, in 1995 no in 1975 it became national parks and no one very much was looking after it and well the bradleys weren't anyway we started up a group here which i can talk about more later but this is where we actually started national parks did a letterbox drop around mossman in 1995 nash the, the a few weeds had grown up since it had been left in the virtually pristine condition, particularly just around here. And this used to be a playground where we're standing. There was a, there was a lovely African olive and a lot of um, cobbler's pegs and all sorts of things. But National Parks did a letterbox drop around here. Someone from the, the, um, the, the school, the TAFE school, had done a project and worked out how this little area here could be restored. So National Parks did the letterbox drop and the local residents, which included me, pounded down to have a look and see what was planned. And I tell you what, it was in a mess. It was asparagus fern and fishbone fern and every weed you can name. Um, so it was a, a group which became smaller over time, but we worked on one Sunday a month for three hours. And over a long space of time, we managed to clear from here down to the path, which you'll see we'll get to later on. But so that was, that was where it started. We, I mean, it was slow. It's pa very painstaking work, but we did it. And it's now in a sort of maintenance situation. We do need to get back. There have been a few little, a bit of a hiatus during COVID and all the rest. So we do need to get back and find out what's growing underneath the things that have grown up so beautifully. But um, we'll, we'll see that later on. So, but it's quite an extensive area, but this was a fairly small area which we started on. Starting here, and gradually pushing down here. We were supervised to start with, and after a while we were left to our own devices and we just turn up one Sunday a month and work away. So that's that bit, yep. But we can now go down to Iluka Road and have a look at where we'll, the viewing points for where the Bradleys lived and, um, and then where we'll, we'll go from there. They, they lived quite modestly. As Anne said earlier, they earned their money from a soft furnishing company, soft furnishings, um, and they had some rent. And their fortunes went up and down over the depression. They went to Winona uh, school, but one of them, Eileen, had to leave early. She was the elder one. She had to leave school early, but Joan managed to get um, complete her studies at um, Winona and then went on to university. So quite an early university student. Um, but so that was, where they, that was where they lived. And I, um, Joan would work along that road and in an area that's known as Joan's Gully. Um, and Eileen worked on this headland. And it's a headland which has, because of its position, it's um, stayed relatively clear of weeds because a lot of, if, if an area's got a lot of houses nearby, 
then of course it'll deteriorate and all the wash will go in and the, and the, um, the weeds from the gardens go in. So around this frontage down there, it's a terrible mess of weeds. But this child ahead, we are really hoping will become quite a, an example of beautiful bushland because it is sort of up a bit and um, doesn't border exactly onto any, any um, residences. Here we are at the entry to our perfect bushland in here, which we're hoping is going to be an example of really good bushland. But what you can see is exactly what happens at the edge of good bushland. You get the invasion from roundabout. And as you can see, this is the edge. And that's what the Bradleys always used to say, keep the interior, work from the interior, work from the good bush into the bad bush. So this is our bad bush. Let's go. <laughs> There's some lovely little pradia there, that's nice. Our, our chief enemy just here is Okna, which comes from lots and lots of gardens around and we have had great fun during Okna flowering season. You should see us out here with our snippers. We go snip, 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 and we just leave them. And then we come back. Now we have to deal with Okna, which was coming. It's, it's been in this area. This was a bad infestation of Okna here. And we do deal with that with a little scrape and poison. If it's a little piece of Okna, we can just pull it out. If the soil's right and if the weather's good, we can pull out the small Okna. But if it's bad Okna, we have had to deal with it by poisoning, scraping and, scraping and painting, which is fairly innocuous, we think. But so this area is one of the areas we've spread to from the original area up there, which I showed you where we started. We've spread down here. We've been concentrating on Okna here particularly. It's sometimes known as Mickey Mouse. It has a pretty little, a very pretty little yellow flower in spring. And then it, has, it develops into red berries in um, early summer. And the birds love it. This is such an example of really beautiful, beautiful bushland. And um, that's why we are so pleased to be working here and pushing out with, into the bad bits, pushing from the good bush to the bad bush, maintaining the good bush. But, you know, we have really not worked here. When we go down here, I'll show you our latest project, which we have a grant for. This area we've brought you to because you can see Bradley's head over here which is where the road was built and the zoo is just over beyond Bradley's head there where all this combination of the Ashton Park um, the Ashton Park Trust um, was working in combination with the zoo so Jones gully where, where the area that Joan worked in would have been it's out of sight but around the corner there the area known as Joan's gully on this side on this side yeah. Yeah. yes but they you know they were walking all through Bradley's yes. head of course as well with their kelpie dogs I mean you can't walk in a national park with a kelpie dog now <laughs> and the other thing about the Bradley's is they smoked so we've got pictures of them holding their dogs in the national park and smoking. <laughs> but they were fabulous. Anne told me just the other day that she, Anne told me the other day, apparently Joan Bradley was a great snow skier. This is the lower end of the area where we were up talking before. I said that's where we started. And now we pushed down here and they did have a fire here in 2016. And that has brought on this, um, which isn't bracken, it's got another name, I've forgotten what it is. And quite a few acacias came up as a result. You know, there has been quite a lot of growth, 
but this is where we're now just maintaining that area.